morning. morning. I'm going to start today's message out with a question that I want to ask you. Have you ever believed something to be so true that no matter what anyone told you, you believed you were right and everyone else was wrong? Okay, got a lot of yeses this service. Last service, everybody just started laughing. (laughs) And I was like, I guess uh, I'll take the laughing to mean that you're all in agreement, that you have been there and done that. Yeah, you know, there are people in history that believe the earth to be flat. And sadly, there are still people who believe that. There were once people in our history that thought the rest of the solar system revolved around the earth, rather than the truth that the earth is just one of several planets that revolve around the sun. Have you ever had something like that, that you were so sure was true, but eventually you found out that you were wrong? Our encounter with Jesus today is a guy who was that way about his faith. He was a Jew. He was a good Jew, like really good. He loved God zealously. In fact, the title of this sermon is The Zealot. Turn to your Bibles, tablets, or phones this morning to Acts chapter 9. We're going to dive right in today, starting in verse 1 of chapter 9. This Pharisee named Saul, young guy, new to his position, passionately defended Judaism, so much so that he became a leader in the destruction of this movement called the Way. It was like his purpose in life. I'm going to protect God. I'm going to protect Judaism. I'm going to protect our way. Just two chapters before, he had stood as the overseer of the stoning of a young Jesus follower named Stephen. We talked about that last week. Men piled their coats at Saul's feet as he watched in approval of Stephen's murder. And soon, that mission was completed, and as soon as it was completed, he went on to the next one, and then on to the next one, and then on to the next one, persecuting the believers every chance he got. Some were killed, some were taken and put in prison, and the church scattered. The apostles, they all stay in Jerusalem while the church scatters everywhere else, and they continued to preach the gospel in the temple. But Saul... He was given this task to seek out and put an end to the church, to follow it to the ends of the earth, wherever it went, and annihilate it. Let's pick up Saul's story beginning in Acts 9, verse 1. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, So that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go to the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but they did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. So Saul, prior to verse 3, was murderous. He was a threatening person. He plotted. He schemed. He was given this authority by the Sanhedrin, the high priest, to go to Damascus and seek out any of these followers of Jesus so they could put them in prison. Now, before I get into his conversion story, I want to take a moment to pause and talk about Saul's zealousness for the Lord. While putting people to death and imprisoning people for what they believe in might seem harsh to us in 2019, put yourselves in Saul's shoes for a moment. Every single thing that he had been taught, everything that he had believed in since he was a young boy, was being torn apart by this Jesus of Nazareth and his followers. 
God, from his perspective, from Paul's perspective, from his, his way of thinking, God was being attacked. The temple was being disgraced. God's leaders, the Sanhedrin, who he looked up to, he looked up to these guys. They were his teachers. They were his mentors. They were being disgraced. They were losing their influence on the people. And for Saul, a young Pharisee, a devout Jew, this was not right. Imagine, if you would, for a moment, that someone came through those doors this morning, walked right into one of our worship services and said, all this stuff that you all believe in, it's, it's hogwash, it's junk, it's garbage. Jesus isn't the way. It would at the very least, and then Jacob's not the guy going to do that. <laughs> that timing was impeccable. <laughs> He's going to give me a hard time about that later. While Jesus is what we believe in, I think at the very least, if someone would come into the service and do something like that today, at the very least it would cause us to stir up a little bit for the kingdom. It would cause us to maybe puff up a little bit. But at the, at the most, man, I think for some of us it would cause our blood to boil. That someone would walk into our place where we worship God and worship Christ and say something against him. That would cause us to be angry, would it not? And that's how passionate Paul was, Saul at the time. Saul was for God. And he was for preserving everything that he believed in. Truth was, Saul did love God. And he loved God so much that I think God said, I got to get a hold of this guy. Because if I can get this guy straightened out, he's going to be the one that's going to take my son's name to the Gentiles. He's the one that's going to spread the kingdom all over the world. So the first thing that happens as God's getting a hold of him is this light from heaven bursts into Saul's path. A light that was so bright that it blinded him. And we know that the, the guys that were with him, it says in the text there that they didn't see what happened. They didn't see the light. They didn't see any of the other stuff, but they heard the voice. And so we have this voice coming from inside the light. Who's referred to as the light in Scripture all over the place? Jesus. Jesus. And that voice coming from the light is his. And he says to him, Saul, Saul. Remember Martha, Martha, and Abraham, Abraham, and Moses, Moses? Remember I said before God, when he wants to get someone's attention, he double names them. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Folks, this is something that we need to understand before we move any further in the text today. When Christians are persecuted, Jesus is persecuted. All over the world, whenever a missionary overseas or someone right here in the United States, anytime someone is persecuted for believing in Jesus, anytime someone is punished for believing in Christ, anytime someone faces negative consequences for believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, anytime that happens, they are persecuting Jesus. So Jesus identifies himself Tell Saul to go on to Damascus and wait for instructions. Now Saul was blinded and he was that way for three days. And I don't know if there's any kind of correlation between Jesus being separated from God for three days and Saul being blinded for three days. I don't know if there's any correlation to that or not. But Saul was definitely humbled for those three days. He was brought to his knees. He was brought to a place of helplessness that he had never experienced before. Saul was a strong young man. And now he was a man that couldn't see. Saul was brought back to earth before he could be used for good. So let's get back to the text. We're going to get to see someone else have an encounter with Jesus starting in verse 10. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias! He only got single names, so he's in, <laughs> he's in good standing with God right now. 
Yes, Lord, he answered. <clears throat> the Lord told him, Go to the house of Judas on the straight street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all of the harm that he has done for, to your holy people in Jerusalem, and he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Now before I get into this encounter, I, I think it's important to note that there are three different guys in the book of Acts named Ananias. So you're, you're, if you read the book of Acts, you're going to see Ananias mentioned a couple different times, and they're actually three different guys. Um, there are three different guys. Uh, you have Ananias and Sapphira that you read in Acts chapter 5. That's a whole different story for another time. Uh, you have this Ananias from Damascus that we're talking about today. And then you have the high priest Ananias that comes later in Acts chapter 23. The name Ananias was like the name Tom or Dave or Mike or Jeff back in that time. It was a very common name. So there were a lot of people that were named Ananias. Just to clear that up in case you run across that in your reading. So this Ananias, this Ananias of Damascus, has an encounter with Jesus of his own. He has this vision. Jesus tells him to go find Saul of Tarsus and heal his sight. And Ananias, he's kind of got the attitude of the prophet Jonah. When God tells Jonah to go talk to the people of Nineveh, and Jonah's like, I'm not going there. And he gets put in the fish, you know, for three days. Ananias has that attitude, and he's like, God, you know I love you, God, but... I know about this guy, Saul. I don't want to go talk to him. He puts people like me in jail. He kills people like me. They stoned Stephen, and he stood there and watched it and approved of it. God, I don't want to go talk to that guy. What happened to him? Couldn't have happened to a nicer guy. You ever been there? You know, it's easy to have an attitude like that towards someone who maybe has hurt us or hurt people that we care about and something bad happens to them, and we've caught ourselves saying, huh, you, you got what was coming to you, buddy. Serves you right. But what was Jesus' reply? Go. You know, when Jonah said no to God, he got swallowed by a fish. Jesus worked a little faster. He didn't mess around. He's like, Ananias, Go. I think it was probably in a scolding tone. I don't want to hear your excuses. Go. And folks, I think this is a lesson for us today. When Jesus tells you to go, you go. If Jesus says, I want you to talk to your brother or sister, you go. If Jesus says, I want you to go do, uh, be a part of this ministry, you go. If Jesus says to you, I want you to go reach out to your family member or your work uh, your coworker at work, or I want you to reach out to your neighbor, you go. He's not messing around. He is calling you to go. So Jesus goes on to say that this guy Saul is my chosen instrument to the Gentiles. In other words, he's my proclaimer. He's the guy that is going to build up my church amongst the Gentile people. But there's something interesting that Jesus adds in this message to Ananias. He says, don't worry, Ananias. He will suffer for me. You know, we talked about this last week. When forgiveness is given, the consequences don't go away. Right? The bitterness and the, and the stuff in our hearts, that's what gets healed. The consequences don't disappear just because we forgive. And God's the same way. Just because he forgives us doesn't mean the consequences go away. Saul still had consequences for what he did to God's people. He was going to suffer greatly for the kingdom 
He says, he will be my instrument, but he will suffer for my name. Those are his consequences. Ananias was obedient. He went to see Saul. Again, it's important to note that upon the healing that he received, Paul was given the Holy Spirit and he was baptized. Again, at the moment of Saul's faith, he received the Holy Spirit and is baptized. It's all happening in the same moment, just like we've been talking about throughout this series. Now Saul's story continues. Look at the second half of verse 19. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on this name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priest? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by uh, proving that Jesus is the Messiah. After many days had gone by, there was a conspiracy amongst the Jews to kill him, but Saul learned of their plan. Day and night they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him, but his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. And if we were to continue, to reading, continue on reading Saul's story, we see that he ends up going back to Jerusalem, and he tries to hang out with the disciples of Jesus in Jerusalem. They're like, no way, dude, we know you. You ain't coming in our church. And they kind of shun him a little bit. So he goes back to his hometown of Tarsus, and that's where he learns how to make tents and uh, support himself that way until he's called uh, into his first missionary journey. And he becomes one of the greatest missionaries, if not the greatest missionary outside of Christ in our human history. This part of the text says that Saul immediately began preaching. It happened immediately. And it caused many people to be in shock. This is the guy who just days ago said he's going to put the Christians in prison, and now he's preaching Jesus? What's going on? I think it's important to point out that Saul's story was so powerful, and he needed to be out there telling it. Jesus can, if Jesus can change a path of a guy like Saul, he can do anything. Do you believe that this morning? Yes. If Jesus can change a guy like Saul who was murderous and, and, and had these threats against these people, he can change his heart. He can do anything. What is your story? We've talked about this a lot over the last several years, that the telling of your story is powerful. While we need to train people to prepare them to to lead. We need to train and, and, and prepare people and equip people before they're released as ministry team leaders or teach a class or, or be an elder or a deacon or any of those leadership positions. Folks, all of us have a story that we need to tell about how Jesus has changed our lives that needs no training. Yes. No preparation. It's our story. We're the only ones that know it. And we should be out there telling it immediately. What has Jesus done for you? I want to challenge you to go home today. Find time sometime today before you go to bed tonight, because I know if you wait till Monday or Tuesday, you're going to forget it, and you're just going to say, oh, I wish I'd have done that. Sometime today, I want you to take 10, 15 minutes. Grab a piece of paper and a pen or a pencil, and I want you to write down the things that God has done for you. Amen. Write them down. All the things that as you, as you look back into your life, you can look back, and, and oftentimes we don't see it right away, but when we look back over our life, we see the times God has shown up, that Jesus has shown up in our life and done something to help us, to guide us, to lead us, to direct us. And while not all of us have had a Damascus Road encounter with Jesus where we get blinded by a white light and we're like, oh yeah, I believe now. He has gotten a hold of every single one of us at some point in our lives and has caused us to change who we are. Yes. And he's done that through the power of his Holy Spirit. He's transformed us by the renewing of our mind into people that we would never have been without him. Folks, you need to tell your story. He gave you your story to tell. 
I can't tell your story. I could tell it. If you told it to me, I could write it down and retell it. It's going to pale in comparison to you telling your story. You need to tell your story. Now, before I go any further, you might be wondering, when does Saul become Paul? You know, I've heard that I know Paul from the letters to the churches, but he was Saul here. How did this all happen? It's not in the text. It's not in this story that we read today. Well, it's commonly misunderstood that Saul had his name changed by Jesus like Peter did, or like God changed Abram's name to Abraham, but that's not the case with Paul. Paul is actually just the Greco-Roman version of the Hebrew named Saul. Just like Yeshua, Jesus' Hebrew name is Jesus in the Aramaic or Greek language. It's just a different version of the same name. So when Paul, it was a practicality thing, when he started teaching people who were Gentiles, people who were from the area of Greece, people who were from the area of Rome, he used the Roman version of his name so that he could make those connections. It would be just like me going maybe to Mexico somewhere and using the name Jefe instead of Jeff so that I could communicate with people more clearly so they would know my name. So that's what Paul was doing there. That's how that all came to be. So the rest of the sermon I'm going to refer to Saul as Paul. And there are four things about Paul's conversion that I noticed while studying it this week. First of all, Paul's conversion was sudden. It happened in a moment. As we share our faith, we should not be frustrated because we are not seeing signs of the Spirit of God working in individuals that we have been working with and praying for. God's timing is God's timing, not ours. So sometimes it's going to take a long time. It's going to take many conversations. It's going to take lots of prayer. But when that person does finally come to that decision that they want Jesus as part of life, it happens in an instant. It happens suddenly. Because of Saul's conversion, we can have confidence that Jesus saves. At times, very suddenly, when we least expect it. You see, folks, when we share our faith with others, we mustn't have any preconceived ideas about whether or not God is working. We must be faithful in proclaiming and leave those results to God. Because he's the one that's going to change somebody's heart anyway. We're just the one making the introduction. Secondly, Paul's conversion was unexpected. What Christ is telling us in Paul's conversion is this. He's saying that he can save anyone he chooses. Even the really bad apples with the hard hearts. Right? Right? even the ones that are considered the lowest of low, even the ones that are considered the meanest of mean. If God wants to change that person's life and save them, God can make that happen because he's God. When Jesus saves the chief of sinners, which is what Paul calls himself, he shows us that he can save anybody. Not only can he save them, but he can turn them into the most amazing preachers, leaders, teachers, disciple makers. Look throughout Scripture. Very few of the people that God uses had stellar backgrounds. They were people just like you and me, messed up people, people with aches and hurts and struggles and sins. And God used every single one of them for his good. That gives us hope, folks, that when we evangelize, we proclaim our faith with everyone and we do it with the anticipation of Christ actually converting souls. Because if Christ can change Paul, he can change anybody. We've got to quit prejudging people as we see them and think, you know, that person, well, I'm surprised they walked through the door. We've got to quit prejudging folks. Because God might have something in store for them that's greater than anything we can ask for or imagine. The next idea, the third idea, is that Paul's conversion was planned. Conversion is a total work of God. Did you get that this morning? Ain't nothing we do. 
Ain't nothing we do that converts somebody, that changes somebody. We make that introduction. We throw that out there. We tell them our story. And then as the Holy Spirit works on that person's heart, God is the one that is changing them, not us. I've been in ministry 15 years now. I ain't saved anybody yet. Amen. I ain't ever gonna. And I'm using ain't on purpose. Amen. It's never gonna happen. God is the one who saves not us. God did not ask for Paul's permission to save him. Paul didn't go to a worship service on a Sunday and respond to an altar call, to an invitation to come down the aisle. In God's good pleasure and for his glory, God overwhelmed Saul of Tarsus with his blinding glory, and Paul was converted exactly the way God had planned it. Jesus had chosen Paul long before Paul chose Jesus. You don't know the plans that God has for that person that you're thinking of as we've been going through this sermon today. You're thinking of somebody. I know, I know what Jeff's saying, but there ain't no way that so-and-so would ever give their life to Christ. Well, that'd never happen. That person's so hard-hearted. That person is so vile. That person is, there's just no way. You never know what God has in store for somebody. So don't give up. Don't ever give up. We all got that somebody in our lives that we're thinking of right now, right? I've got one on my heart right now. But I'm never going to give up. Because if God God can soften Paul's heart and change him, he can change anybody. We just have to have faith, we have to trust, we have to keep doing what we do. Which brings us to the final idea. Paul's conversion was purposeful. Paul's mission would be the exact opposite of what Paul set out to do when he left Jerusalem. He left Jerusalem to put people in jail, and instead he was placed in chains for the gospel the rest of his life. Christ had prepared beforehand that Saul, the persecutor of the church, would be transformed into her greatest missionary. Paul's encounter with Jesus radically changed him. He went from persecuting the church to being a faithful shepherd protecting the church. Every one of his letters to the churches, to the Corinthians, to the Philippians, to the Ephesians, to the Colossians, to the Galatians, he was constantly trying to help them, and he's trying to protect what God had created, right? Warning them not to do this or not to do that and encouraging them. He became one of the greatest shepherds of the church, not for his glory, but for God's. And the main point of this all is, is that Paul went from the attacker to a protector because of an encounter with Jesus that overpowered him with God's grace. God's grace is that powerful. I don't care if it's a person who's committed murder. I don't care if it's a person who has committed adultery. I don't care if it's a person who's done whatever awful thing that you can think of that you think is worse than whatever you've done. God can get a hold of that person with his grace and change their life forever. What about us? What about you? Is there someone in your family, in your circle of friends, or someone that you work with that you've been thinking, there's no way that person could be converted? There's no way. There's no way. But I have to ask you, what effect would they have on the world around them if they were? What changes could they bring about in the lives of others if they were changed. And the only person that can make that change is God. Amen. Would your family be different if that person you've been thinking of, it's in your family, changed? Yes. Was changed by the love of Jesus, by the grace of Jesus? Would that make a difference? What about in your circle of friends? That one person you're thinking of, you love that, that guy or that gal, you love that person, but man, they are a mess. There's just no way 
Would their world be different? Would there be a revival in our community if Jesus got a hold of the people that you're thinking of this morning? The conversion of Paul had a rippling effect that is still being felt today. Gentiles can claim Christ because God worked through Paul. And we are part of the Gentiles, unless you grew up as a Jew somewhere and converted to Christianity. We are all Gentiles. And the only reason we have this is because God communicated to the Gentile people through Paul. Listen to what Paul said of himself in Philippians chapter 3. I say this a lot. I say this is one of my favorite scriptures. You'll hear me say that a lot. This one is my favorite. Um, on my bio on the website, I quote one of the verses from this text as my favorite verse. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But, but whatever were gains to me now, I consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and the participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all of this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took a hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind me and straining forward toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Man. That last, that last two verses, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press on to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Are you pressing on? Are you striving for what is ahead? Forgetting what's behind? There's messes back there in my life I don't even want to get into. We'd be here all day, and none of you need to know all that stuff anyway. <laughs> and we all have that, right? Forgetting about what is behind and straining towards what, what is ahead for us. The belief. Say it louder. Heaven. Heaven. Eternal life. Eternity with God. Salvation. All right what your faces are saying man that's what we are to be striving toward that's what should get us up in the morning that's what should get us focused for the day that's what should drive us home at night that's what should get us fired up to work with our kids and our grandkids to help them understand that they need Jesus too Straining toward what is ahead and forgetting what is behind, we press on toward the goal. Will you press on with me? Let's pray. Father God, we come before you today. And you have reminded us through the great Apostle Paul, not great because of who he was, but great because of what you did with him. We've been reminded about his journey 
for bringing, being the self-proclaimed greatest of sinners to being the greatest missionary you ever sent forward outside of your son. Father, we thank you for his words that challenge us, that push us. We thank you for his story, his Damascus Road story. How a hard-hearted man bent on persecuting your people was stopped suddenly in the middle of a road and told, you're not going to do that anymore. You're going to come work for me. And he did. And we praise you for that, Father God. We praise you for intervening in the life of Saul and how he became the great writer Paul, the great missionary, the great church planner, not for his glory, not for his fame, but for yours. Father, let us take that example as we have with all of these encounters with Jesus that we have seen, let us take that example and let us use it. Let us run with it. Let us remember our sin and, and not for the purpose of beating ourselves up, but for the purpose of remembering how great you are and how you have saved us from it. Let us take time this week to think about all the ways that you have shown up in our lives. Let us worship you for that. And Father, let us have this burning desire in our hearts again to get up and go for you. To share and proclaim the gospel that you have given us. To tell the stories that you have given us. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.